Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to session number three of Career Expo. As you know, Career Expos are typically events that are held before major conferences like the one happening next week, which is the Canadian Women in Cybersecurity Conference. My name is Ali Hirji. I lead both the AI and cybersecurity practices at Durham College. And this wouldn't be the first time where you've heard me talk about the concept of diversity, of skill, thought, and experience. I've never really looked at diversity as a singular concept talking about people's origins or people's you know, ethnic background. I think of diversity as being much more than that. And I couldn't think of a better organization to bring to this discussion than the Career Foundation. Many of you would remember the Career Foundation from last year's Canadian Women in Cybersecurity and every other subsequent event since there. And if you go onto their website, you will notice that they've got programs for every age group, for every skill category, and for almost every situation that you could find yourselves in. Diversity, as a mentor of mine once says, is the mix. Inclusion is getting that mix to work for you. And I couldn't think of a better organization when it comes to diversity and inclusion than the Career Foundation. For those of you tuning into this session, not only has the Career Foundation posted a couple of jobs that they're hiring for, but on this session today, you're gonna to learn about opportunities that they have for you, but more importantly, learn about how they're dealing with opportunities and challenges when it comes to diversity and inclusion. And joining Career Foundation, we have two expert speakers who are gonna be giving you their perspective on what you as a future employee may want to be thinking about and what employers themselves want to be cognizant about when it comes to diversity and inclusion and hiring practices. Get comfortable to, leave, to be a little bit uncomfortable, but we're gonna be having an open discussion. Please share your questions in the live chat or directly with me through direct message. So without further ado, I'm gonna ask my panelists to introduce themselves. And I'm gonna start off with Eve by asking her to A, talk to us about her role, what she does at the Career Foundation, and what excites her about the work that she does. Eve, let's begin with you. Thank you so much, Ali. It's so um, such an honor to be here. And thanks for that beautiful introduction. Career Foundation, um, is interested and excited about the work that we can do to advance diversity. Specifically, what I do at the Career Foundation is I'm the VP of Strategic Development, and, and that includes workforce development partnerships. Career Foundation um, is excited about cybersecurity because we know that that is the future. We know the future of work is not only enabled, but dependent on cybersecurity. And it's exciting because you could start your career for cybersecurity at any point in where you're at. Um, and that is something that job seekers are excited about. Absolutely. And I think this aspect of the timeline for cybersecurity and when can you start in a career in cybersecurity is something that I want to unpack. To our audience, you've heard me say this before, it's never too late to be early. And you may think you're at an early stage in your cybersecurity knowledge, but it's never too late to have that conversation of what you could do in that sector. Speaking about the diversity of skill set and timing in cybersecurity, my next guest is Panke. And I'm going to ask Panke to introduce herself, tell us a little bit about her role and what excites her about the role that she plays in the community. Panke? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Hallie. Hi, everyone. And I'm so excited to be here. As you can see, I'm all smiles. I'm excited to have this conversation. My name is Funke. I'm a senior consultant within Deloitte Cyber Risk Services with area of focus on data protection and privacy. Uh, the one thing that excites me about cybersecurity will be the evolving technology. It's constantly evolving. And I know that you've heard a lot of people talk about that, but literally it's evolving, it's changing. And um, it cuts across different sectors. It cuts across not just, it cuts across your day-to-day your day -day life. Most of us have social media and cybersecurity is also involved in that. So it cuts across everything you can think about. That excites me. And it also keeps me on my toes, especially with the type of work that I do, given that I provide client services and um, it's a collaborative environment. So you can know it all. There's no one person that knows everything. It's pretty, it's very much collaborative, not just within the firm, but I'm saying within the cybersecurity space. So that alone is exciting, having conversations with peers, understanding what they do and the, around the cyberspace. And um, not to get too technical, but 
cyber is broad and there are different aspects of cyber. So somebody might be doing data privacy, another person might be doing crisis management, another person might be doing identity and access management, another person is focused on cloud security. There are so many aspects of cyber. So just having the conversations with different people, understanding the aspects of cyber they're involved in, the type of work that they do, it's exciting. And just reading about it on the news, knowing that this is my profession, this is what we do. It's that all of our other aspects is actually exciting for me. So yeah, I will stop there and then go to no, the later. You know, the three <laughs> themes of cyber, right? Collaboration, community, and more importantly, communication. You need to know how Absolutely. to collaborate. You need to have Absolutely. And you need to know how to communicate. And these are skills that we're going to be unpacking a little. These are the diversity of skills that we were talking yeah. about. Yeah. We're going to unpack how Career Foundation can help you with that and some of the roles they can prep you for. Yeah. And with last but not the least, Kaylee has some significant experience in the learning space and the management space. Kaylee, introduce yourself, the work that you do, and what excites you about the services that you enable. Kaylee? Thank you so much. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kaylee Shell. I am currently the Senior Manager of Professional Development and Education for the Financial Crimes Unit at BMO. Um, the Financial Crimes Unit, it's a relatively new approach to cyber, actually. It, it takes cybersecurity and looks at it as a function that's integrated with the physical security, enterprise fraud management, and business continuity management at the bank. Um, so at BMO, we're approaching those all, as you know, their own business areas still, but one integrated unit, which I think is a really innovative and exciting way uh, to be uh, approaching it. Um, like Ali said, yeah, I have uh, relatively extensive experience in, in learning and development and workforce management, uh, and particularly in cybersecurity. Um, one thing that excites me about the work that I do, um, I would have to say the use of enterprise data and machine learning to make more informed business decisions is something that gets me really excited. You know, I think making business decisions without data to back them up, well, that's just sort of somebody's opinion. Um, so the increased use of, uh, of data for descriptive and predictive analytics uh, to forecast future trends and labor force needs is something that I have been very into lately. Thank you. Couldn't have said that better. And God, we trust everybody else must bring data. Kelly, thank you so much for that fantastic introduction. And all of you ladies for introducing yourselves, not just from the practice of what excites you about your work, but also what our audience needs to be thinking about. We have over 60 viewers right now. And please, again, as I reminded you, drop your questions. If you don't want to drop them in the live chat, I know some of you may feel a little uncomfortable sometimes with that. Feel free to drop it for me in the direct message and I'll make sure that I read them out and we get some responses to you. So, Eve, let's, let's come to you. You know, I've always said this when I've built teams in AI and in cybersecurity is that talented teams will get you know, possible things done. Diverse teams will get the impossible done. When I look at the work that you do, not only do you assist companies with finding the right candidates, not only do you train candidates, you work on multiple other areas to ensure that careers and jobs in Ontario are reflective of a diverse ethos. Can you tell us a little bit about the multiple services that you run through the Career Foundation? Eve? Yeah, there are two um, really huge umbrellas of work that we do. One is with job seekers and the other one is with employers. And we've been doing this um, for 32 years now and really we've been always with those two groups trying to align the demand side of the labor market with the supply side of the labor market. And so with job seekers, we wanna make sure that they all have access to equal opportunities. Um, and so we've been building programs for young people for a very long time, for newcomers, for women, uh, for people with disabilities. I mean, really differently abled people because autism, for example, is a huge advantage in the tech sector. And so we have been working on the employer side to help them recognize the advantages of bringing in diverse talents into their workforce and really doing that education piece to show them the value proposition of bringing in talent um, from different backgrounds and how that really enhances the products that they create and the solutions that they deliver. Um, and so really the Career Foundation is all about workforce development projects 
that create inclusive pathways for people to get jobs in stable and growing sectors like cybersecurity. Um, so really, that's really the premise of the work that we do. Absolutely. And you know, Eve, uh, you know, this is the saying, right, that, you know, you should expect the unexpected. When we were, when we were discussing this session, you know, we didn't discuss this aspect of, you know, autism as an advantage in the tech space. But now that you bring it up, you know, I, I really, you know, I know quite a few individuals around this platform that have, you know, in, in confidence expressed to me, you know, some of the challenges that they face and how can you convert those challenges into strengths. And I certainly agree with you that even when I look at the boards that you make up and the advisory groups that you set up, you look at that diversity. I want to hold that thought and come back to differently abled individuals as well and how you support them. And I'm going to bring in Funke and Kelly into the conversation. Funke, let's, let's build on what Evan was just talking about. And this was on the aspect of helping folks with establishing a pathway, helping them go through a bit of a journey. As we all know, success is a journey, not a destination. Helping people build journeys of learning and journeys of engagement. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you started on this journey in cybersecurity and what were some of the key influences that impacted your journey? Phil? Absolutely. Um, my journey started, I would say, as far back as when I was doing my internship. I did my first degree in computer information systems back in Nigeria. And uh, during my internship, I was exposed to network security specifically. And I was always, I was wondering that why this is, years ago, trust me. <laughs> and I was wondering, wow, what, what is this, this aspect is different from what I know already. And when I was done with school, I said I had that. It was more like the seed that's been planted, but I wasn't exactly sure of what to do with it. After that, I started working in the financial industry. I was working in the IT department, mainly around IT management and operations. But there was an incident that happened to someone that I know of that had an issue with phishing emails and she clicked on the wrong link and the story goes on. And when she told me about it, I, I felt like, I, I, felt, I felt vulnerable because I felt like I'm in IT, I should be able to explain what happened to you. But at that point in time, there was the knowledge gap. Like, I, I feel like I've heard about this security, but I wasn't sure because then I was doing more of operations and administration. I wasn't focused on cybersecurity. Right. That was where, that was what sparked the desire to go do my master's in information system security. So I did my master's in, um, yeah, in information system security at Concordia University in Montreal. Mm -hmm. An amazing program cuts across so many aspects of cybersecurity, application malware, executive database security, operation system security. I don't want to get into the details. And so, and just like any other institution, you have your career fair, you know, organizations will come and talk to you about how they can develop your skills. Kind of, exactly just like what Career Foundation is doing today, building on the knowledge that the students already have. And I decided that I wanted to work in a, an organization that I can be exposed to everything there is to know about cybersecurity. Remember that my master's was in information system security. So it was fully technical, I would say. It was mainly around everything information system security. But when you come down to when you come down to the organization, that's where you understand that cybersecurity is broad and you can choose, you can decide what aspect of cybersecurity you want to focus on because there's cloud, there's data protection, there's crisis management, there's ident incident response, you have application security, et cetera. So I would say that if you had to ask me what was the what, at what point did it change? It was it was the point where I figured when I realized that there was a knowledge gap for myself, considering myself as an IT professional and I didn't know about cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. Knowing that I've had the foundation somewhere during my internship, I didn't build up on it. I, I decided to follow a different path in IT. But then I came back to cybersecurity and to just to understand and for myself, demystify the old concept around cybersecurity. That was it for me. So it was, I would say it started from my internship and every other thing just happened to fall in place step by step. And the actual step I did was to decide I was going to do my master's in information security. So yeah, so that would be it. Fantastic. And I think, you know, you said it so eloquently that we need to recognize our blind spots. So lesson mm -hmm. number one to everybody is that while it's great to get feedback about how well you're doing, mm -hmm. get back and note what you are not doing 
strategy is the art of choosing what not to do so you need to develop that strategy <laughs> i'm glad that that brought you to smile because most of my students when they hear me say that they're like what is this guy on so i'm glad i'm making sense or humor to people on this <laughs> Kelly, let's let's come to you now. And this is let's pick up a little bit of what Frankie talked about. You know, you're in the space of developing learning systems, developing learning programs in a very new sector as well. Did you ever think that this was the unit that you would be working under? And now that you're there, how are you supporting people on their learning journeys as well? Kelly? Um, yeah, I mean, did I ever think I would be uh, working in the business unit I'm working in when I started my career? I mean absolutely not like if there's anyone out there who has no background in cyber and is looking to kind of make a lateral move into cybersecurity, I can tell you you know it's definitely possible um I did my undergrad in um political science and theater and then did a postgrad in human resources management and actually I started my career working for the career foundation and reporting to Eve um so it's a wonderful place, great place to work, and also probably where I got my first exposure to the cyber field. Um, I was a job developer there briefly for um, the Career Focus Program, which is a STEM program for new graduates to help them get placements in there and their line of work. Um, it was a really great experience. Loved working there, loved learning about, you know, emerging trends um, in each of those fields and what kind of tech startups were coming out at the time and stuff like that. Uh, and I had a really great manager. So that was wonderful. Um, from there, I went on to become an HR coordinator at a small tech startup where I also kind of did a little bit of like cyber awareness stuff uh, and maybe started to realize at that time that it was something that um, really interested me. And then from there, I kind of made the jump over to financial crimes unit in BMO. So, you know, I would say my career journey has been a mix of both like having the right skills and experience, but also um, seizing opportunities. I think I've said yes to like every opportunity that anyone has ever offered me or come my way. Um, it helps with networking, exposure, skill building. Uh, and even if you don't see a direct correlation to the career path you think you want, like sometimes it's still a really great opportunities. For example, I volunteered as a team lead for Leaning Canada sponsorship team for a few years. Um, I had no desire to work in sales or sponsorship, um, but I did get really great people management skills, which I'm now using in my job with BMO to lead a team. So sometimes, you know, uh, saying yes to those opportunities, I think, can really be what makes the difference to build those skills and network. Um, but kind of touching on what you said too, Ali, like, I think it's equally important to guard your yeses with no. Um, in my line of work, one of the most common complaints I see, or not complaints, but maybe, you know, feedback I get a lot is people saying, I'm working so hard. I feel like I'm doing everything right. I'm investing all of this time and I still, I can't seem to get ahead. Uh, and they're just looking for a faster track to advance their career. Um, and this is not a statement to dissuade people from working hard. It's just sort of, again, a fact. Like companies, you know, they're going to compensate you um, on how difficult you are to replace, not on how hard you work. Yeah. Um, so wow. my advice to them is typically, you know, if you want to advance and you want to get further, um, then make yourself harder to replace. Upskill, reskill, become a subject matter expert you know, decide why you want to make a difference and then get the skills you need to go out and make that difference. Um, I also think that goes nicely hand in hand with like kind of less focus on the what I, I call rise and grind culture um, and more of a focus on having like a fulfilling career in something that you're passionate about. I'm voting all three of you for president, prime minister, and <laughs> governors of the world. In just 15 minutes, the kind of wisdom that has been dropped like liquid. I really hope all of you are making notes of this because this is what it is about. You know, I'll add a little note to this is that, you know what, there's, there are job opportunities that are out there, yeah. but it's not just about you putting in your resume there. It is about knowing these contextual realities. Job interviews don't happen in a vacuum. And I really hope to those individuals watching, even notice the way all three of our panelists today are presenting themselves, how they've positioned uh, within the camera, how they're articulating 
the way they're timing themselves, all has, all of this are necessary feedback points for all of you that are watching. So Kelly, thank you so much uh, for that uh, for that elaboration. And, and I couldn't agree with you more on the aspect of make yourself harder to replace. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, nobody's going to value you if you don't value yourself. And that is an important point. And Eve, I want to bring you back into the conversation. Uh, and and Franke and Kelly, I'm going to speak openly. We had this discussion as well, because we need to be focusing on the diversity piece. You know, we have one person who is a person of color. We have another with diverse experiences and has gone through different environments as well. Diversity of, you know, the journey, so to speak. Eve, one of the questions that I have for you is on this aspect of you know, you're recruiting and you're helping folks in technology jobs, but also, you know, in other areas as well. How are you shattering some of the stereotypes? Because one of the things that I've seen is even in your, your tech trainings that you do or the tech workshops that you have, it's not male dominated. You folks have got specific metrics to make sure that you're bringing in div a, a diverse crowd. How are you doing this and what are you committing yourselves to? You? I think it's really about intention. And so we've been very intentional to sort of break those stereotypical roles. We want to make sure that we, we have women represented in tech and that, that's why we invited these folks onto the, to our panel today. We want to have conversations because what we've heard from job seekers is, I don't think I can be because I don't see myself reflected in those roles. And that is really what's driving our intention so we're making sure that we put people on panels in, uh, in front of employers that rub against those stereotypes, that can prove that they have the ability to perform at a high level or higher than the employer's expectation, regardless of what those stereotypes were. And so our people are equipped and trained in challenging those stereotypes with employers before putting our candidates in front of employers. So. So we start off with that employer education. And so when we bring a candidate, the employer is already receptive. So really that trickles down in all of the work that we're doing um, because we're intentional about making that dial move forward in equity and inclusion. Absolutely. And you know, another important thing that I'll raise to our audience over here, you know, I've often said that without diversity, our word would be very, very boring. Now, Eve, I'm going to call you out on this. I get quite a few emails from Eve in the, in the week, but I always respond. And I'll tell you why, even though sometimes I'm juggling a couple of meetings, I'll come to the advisory meetings or I'll come to some of the sessions, sometimes because you can actually just relate on different levels. One of the things that happens a lot at the Career Foundation, so those of you, again, you're tuning into it, um, Eve has a Caribbean background and I love food, as you can probably tell. So I immediately start talking to her about food in Guyana or in Trinidad and you build those relations. It really is about making yourself relatable to the people that you're going to work with. And Career Foundation has workshops to help you with those soft skills as well. It's one of the reasons I've been a part of it very actively because I get to meet diverse groups. I get to, in a safe space, practice my communication skills. Lesson number two for all of you. Funky, I want to come to you because a question has come in. And Kelly, I'll also get your perspective on this from an immigration standpoint. And Eve will come to you with some remarks on it as well. And Funky, somebody made the observation that, you know, you studied in, in Montreal, uh, Quebec. And obviously, or, you know, I, I, can't, I can't say obviously, but it's assumed that you've got, you know, bilingual. How important has been, has the diversity of language been for you in the progression of your career? Okay. It's interesting. I'm not bilingual. <laughs> I know, assumption that was I'm not, I speak very little French, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but so I do, I mean, like this, I would answer this question from my knowledge. And like I mentioned, I speak to my peers a lot. I would say that it's important depending on the type of job that you're doing. In my type of job, we're providing client services. So if you're working in a particular environment where you need to constantly converse in um, English or French to your clients, I would say that that is a necessary skill to have in terms of being bilingual. But if you're in a city where you don't need to, if you're in a city where in English is the prominent language, say for example, Toronto or other parts of Canada, except from Ottawa and Quebec, then you, I, I would say it's not necessary that you have to be bilingual to have those, I mean, for you to climb up the ladder. 
But uh, I, like I said, it also depends on the type of role, I mean, the type of work that you're doing. If you're in consulting, yes, you will be having a lot of client conversations. You'll be meeting with clients. You'll pretty much be explaining technical terms to them in non-technical ways, especially when you're talking to the business and the executive management. You need to let them know what the situation of things and how bad they look or how good they look without having to speak te technical jargons, I would say, quote unquote. Um, but if you're working in a financial institution where you're mostly back and you're only talking to your colleagues and your coworkers and your team members, I would say that, no, I mean, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that you have to be bilingual for you to climb up the ladder in that type of industry. So I would, it depends on the industry that you're working with. That will determine whether or not you need to be bilingual for you to rise up your ladder, I would say. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I'd also add to that, you know, great question to the person who direct messaged it to me. Uh, I'll add another point to that is that, especially in cybersecurity, uh, when you are doing, for example, threat intelligence, when you are doing, so, you know, studying social engineering campaigns, yeah. Knowing different languages is very important because also language is a key to the personality of an individual, the words mm -hmm. that are being used, what are being stressed, the cultural tones, mm -hmm. et cetera. You know, very important point. And I want everyone to understand this because in the IBM session, I saw somebody bring up this aspect of, hey, I'm in environmental studies or I'm in sociology. Can I do something in cyber? And I would absolutely. say absolutely yes. yes. What in yes. the world is not cybersecurity anymore? And with yes. that, Kelly, there's I, a okay. go ahead, uh, Funky. I was going to, yeah, I was just going to jump on that because Kelly had mentioned that and I was I was going to build up on that. I would say yes, because my background was in information system security, but I'm presently doing data privacy and protection. And like I mentioned, I moved from Nigeria here. So I had, I had to understand what privacy regulations look like here. And in addition to that, when you were talking about diversity, even within my team, we're so diverse that I also work with privacy lawyers within cybersecurity. So on a good day, anyone would think, oh, but I studied law. Why would that work in cybersecurity? But Everyone knows, everyone is seeing the news, WhatsApp is doing, the, I mean, just every, everything is going on out there. It's all in the news. It's, we are seeing the importance of data privacy and as it relates to cybersecurity. And that's just to show you that you can't, don't limit yourself or whatever skills that you have. I've, I've, I've had to have conversation with people that are in cybersecurity and their background was in communications. Their mm -hmm. background was in international arts. But you wouldn't, you can't tell because of the level of knowledge that they bring when we're having conversation about cybersecurity. So that's one thing I, I would, I want a lot of our listeners to understand that do not limit yourself. Just like Kelly had mentioned, if you look at whatever you think you're studying or you're done with school, whatever I think that you, your first degree is, that should not be directly proportional to whether or not you can work in cybersecurity. You can start your career in cybersecurity whenever you want to start your career in cybersecurity. I didn't have a background in data privacy before I joined the firm, but now I'm not, I'm not, I no longer have the knowledge. I'm also certified in data privacy. So yep. it's never too late to start and it's never impossible to start. I just wanted to put that out there. No, absolutely. Yes. It's not about the subject. It's about the skill. And I want to work with this skill because a question has come in and Kelly, this one is directed at you, which is reflective of the soft skills. So, you know, we have a lot of folks who you know, have studied sociology, studied philosophy, et cetera. What are some of the soft skills they need to be paying attention to if they are going to have a successful entry, for that matter, into the world of cybersecurity? Kelly? Um, great question. I mean, um, so I feel like when we talk about cybersecurity, um, the first thing that pops into your head is going to be like, a security operations center, or, you know, we were just talking about languages. I was going to make a joke like, well, if the languages are JavaScript uh, or SQL, then probably, yes, huge asset. Um, but it's more cyber is so much more than just like developing cloud architecture or working in a security operations center. You know, there are a lot of other jobs as well. There's cyber awareness, communications jobs, operations teams, learning and development like myself. Um, you know, at BMO, we have business information security officers whose uh, primary role is to liaise with our, our lines of business to ensure that um, everything's being executed properly and safely. And like those types of jobs do require um, a lot more soft skills and emphasis on soft skills, stronger communication skills. 
Um, I think business writing is like an, an invaluable skill, um, especially, you know, in a job where you're going to be uh, liaising with stakeholders a lot. It, it all depends on the nature of the role, but um, that's a huge one is the ability to write effectively. Um, I would also say like, don't underestimate the value of being good at graphic design um, because you wouldn't, you would be shocked by the amount of people who like, uh, can't put a decent PowerPoint slide together. And you might be the smartest, most technical person in the world uh, and have like, and be amazing at your job. But if you can't like take it up to 40,000 feet and brief people on what you're actually, you know, taking away from if, if you are working in security operations, you need to be able to reiterate that information to other people as well, right? Um, so those I think are some skills that, are crucial in any role, um, but especially crucial in the security space where often you need to move information very quickly uh, and very succinctly. So, yeah. Absolutely. And you know what, you've made such an important point because I remember, you know, at CISO Forum 2020, one of the award winners was Jamie Reese, a very well-known CISO out of New Brunswick. And he talked about this idea of the power of showing up. You need to show up. You need to be there. You need to be listening for what people are not listening for, reading for what's not written. And those soft skills, just the person who can mm -hmm. do that PowerPoint, who can do that Canva and get the message out there. I think for our audience, another read, I've lost count of all of the lessons, but you know, if you're taking notes, this is another one. We often talk about the medium is the message, right? And this is it, knowing how to know what which, uh, which medium you're picking for your message, how you're presenting your information to enable decision makers to say whether to pick one software or the other to make that adjustment in the financial budget. It all comes down to these soft skills. So Kelly, thank you for not just pointing out the skills, but examples of how you deploy them. Speaking about the power of showing up, Eve, when you look at these soft skills, when you look at the diversity of language, the diversity of thought, one of the engines of Canada has been immigration. And a challenge that we often hear is about folks coming into Canada and let's take in the Career Foundation's case, coming into Ontario, especially the GTHA, and not being able to translate into Canadian what their experiences and skill sets are. What are some of the things that you're doing to ensure that our immigrant population with a lot of technology talent are getting access to the right opportunities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. I really would love to pivot back later on to mindset, though. That is my, my jam. So, um, but... Well, in terms of working with immigrants, we certainly provide a lot of one-on-one -on -one support to them. Um, in terms of helping them to articulate and sort of realign their messaging, not necessarily their skills, because yeah. nothing was wrong with that, right? It was how you articulate your experience into a Canadian context. And so that's what our people do every day, working with uh, clients. But what we also do is we try to arrange mentorship we try to do a lot of panels like these, actually, bringing in industry experts to speak to our newcomers. Accenture is a great one that has been fantastic with speaking to our newcomers about the how do you transition? How do you make that transition? What the experiences have been like? What are some entry points that you can take? Tata Consulting is another one that's been supporting us in this area in really educating. I mean, the Career Foundation, we can work with people one-on-one, -on -one, um, but you know, hearing from industry experts really makes a massive difference. And so our immigrants to Canada really appreciate exposure to industry experts, but also like that sort of one-on-one -on -one support to guide them as they try to navigate a, a really disrupted labor market right now. Absolutely. The one-on-one -on -one support, the mentorship programs as well, that all have a huge impact on that immigrant experience and giving you that journey. So I do recommend, especially we do have quite a few international students that I see that have joined as well. You know, it can be challenging waters to navigate. There are legal implications as well that some of you may not be aware of. What do I need to be thinking about? Reach out to the folks at the Career Foundation because they do have, if someone doesn't know, one of the strengths of the Career Foundation is if they don't know, they'll tell you what they do not know and point you in the right direction. And that's why many of us join their advisory groups so that we can help continuously bring in more talent, more skill sets, more advice that can help folks that are navigating these waters as well. So thank you, Eve, for that. You know, when we draw on this aspect of immigration and we talk about diversity, 
we all inevitably have to talk about within the cyberspace, how you know, the Greer Foundation and its allies have also been shattering certain stereotypes. Fun care questions come in and I promised I wouldn't uh, you know, deflect any tricky questions. I'm gonna word it a little bit more, you know, for lack of a better word, a little more sanitized. Um, but I'm going to bring this to you directly, Funke, and that is, so the individual who sent me this question has referenced 419 scams, which I'm sure you might be aware of uh, emanating from, uh, from certain areas of Africa. And the question that he's asked is, uh, how do you deal with certain stereotypes, especially in the workplace, when, especially in cybersecurity, when jokes can be made about you know, certain areas that people come from and how cyber crimes are rampant in those areas. So for example, fun can I'll be directly about it, you know, and, and I'm guilty of this as well. You know, when I, I have quite a few students from Nigeria and sometimes, you know, we'll say, hey, you're from the 419 land, eh? The ones who are going to chop your dollar. How do you help people with overcoming some of those stereotypes to see the talent that comes from different countries? Fun okay? That's a great question. And to summarize it, I would say I show up with my authentic self. I show up letting you know that um, where someone comes from, it's not, I mean, like having a stereotype or should I say a general mindset about a place does not automatically mean everybody there is the product. Everybody there looks or acts that way. So I show up with my authentic self. I show up with the value that I bring and the knowledge, the wealth of knowledge that I have. And, um, and I think it's these types of comments that really drive me to be better and to show, or should I say, yeah, to show and prove to people that good can come out of places like that. So, and then also for other people that are there that genuinely want to be better, as just what you've mentioned, even Ali, just to be able to look up and say, okay, I see someone that looks like me there. It means that I could get there as against just getting crushed from the foundation where they are still having the idea of doing something in line with this space. And aside from that, Canada also being um, a concept, I'll say, yeah, being a, should I say, the culture around Canada, let me use the word, and around the workplace would, would I would say they do not, condone, they have zero tolerance to those type of comments. So I have not had that one-on-one to my face, I would say, in my place of work and interactions generally. But I do know that those types of comments exist. And uh, what I would say in summary is that I show up as the authentic self and the wealth of knowledge that I have to shut down those comments and let people know that People can actually genuinely be good and have, the, we have white hats, Akas, let's use that word. So not everyone is doing this type of work for ulterior motive or just to take advantage of people. Um, there are people that are doing this as their profession and they are proud of it. So the summary of that will be that I show up as my authentic self and as the knowledge that I have. Yeah. And, I, and I couldn't agree with that more. Humor becomes, you know, a window into reality. And sometimes we need to think about that these jokes that we sometimes make, especially from a geographical standpoint, mm-hmm. it can mar how somebody is viewed technically as well. But mm-hmm. I really like the way in which you've, you know, you've reversed the situation. We all know that, yes, uh, these scams have originated or germinated quite a bit, for example, in Lagos, as an example. But one of the things that I still remember a student of mine did so very well is like, yeah, yeah, we are the land of 419 scams, but you know what? Uh, the 1992 Football World Cup, we were the land of Russia, Yakini and Kano, and we shook the football market. So, you know, that are those things where, you know, you realize somebody's flipping that and empowering themselves. Yeah. Another yeah. lesson is I really, really stress upon this as an immigrant myself, is that you should not be afraid to draw on that cultural contextual experience. One of the things that I do, for example, in meetings is I'll make references to cultural areas that I'm aware of. So for example, you would have heard of the term, you know, when we're sitting in, you know, intelligence meetings or we're sitting in incident response meetings, somebody will say, my two cents are we should provision this uh, and close this port. I'll say my two rupees are I'm going to do this. (laughs) It states a particular point in the room. To that, I want to bring Kelly back into the conversation because it's important Mm -hmm. to realize, you know, these soft skills also have other meanings besides just you know, where do you come from, et cetera, and how do you communicate that? And this question is particularly poignant because I think it points to a binary in the tech space, especially in cyber, that you can address, Kaylee. And I'll read it verbatim. It says, are you finding that even though we are starting to diversify, having more women into the cybersecurity space, are you finding that women in cyber are now going more towards the qualitative side 
the marketing, the PR side, and less to the technical side. Kelly, your observations on this? Um, I mean, yes and no. Um, you know, just like bringing it back to for a minute the the diversity piece and the diversity of thought piece because I think that really comes into play here as well, um, which is that, you know, people who all think the same way are not going to be able to solve complex problems. So there's inherent value in bringing diversity into the workplace and in fostering an inclusive culture, um, you know, be it with women or people of color or persons with disabilities. Like, you know, I myself, I have epilepsy. Um, so the workplace sometimes is, you know, walk in the park. It's always a bit awkward, you know, having seizures at work, kind of hard to talk about, same kind of thing. But when you build those relationships with your coworkers, um, that's kind of what it starts with, right? Um, so I think like when you look at women, are they more drawn to the called qualitative and quantitative roles? I say yes and no, because like in some instances, the answer to that it would be yes, but does that mean there are are no or less um, women in those quantitative or qualitative sorry quantitative roles? No, we have lots of women who are in in highly technical roles that that require a high amount of skills. Um, I think that if we were to literally just look at the numbers, yes, there are more in qualitative roles, but there are more and more coming into those quantitative roles as well because people want diverse skill sets. Um, they want people who think differently and can take more innovative approaches to problem solving. Um, and everyone who has the same education and same background and thinks the same way, they're not going to drive efficiencies. They're not going to drive your organization forward. Um, so I don't know. That, that was kind of an indirect answer, I guess, but I hope it kind of addresses the question a little bit. No, I think it does. And, you know, from a diplomatic standpoint, it's always great to go yes and no. But I think there was more <laughs> to that also when you spoke about this aspect of, look, you know, you need to pay attention to the trends. And one thing that, you know, I was listening to what you were saying, you know, when I look at some of the women leaders, for example, leading the board for Canadian Women in Cyber, uh, we have Olive mm -hmm. Zach Zalo from Huawei, um, Eastern European. We have folks from India. We have folks in Beyond Borders from Pakistan, from Iran. One of the things that I observed doing a lot of work in data analytics, uh, analytics is a lot of data scientists, women from Iran, very strong in math, so on and so forth. I do think that there are some, some communication things that we can talk about in terms of how these individuals are portrayed on social media or how they present themselves and brand themselves, which I think is another separate topic altogether on the soft skill of knowing how to brand yourself online. And oh, absolutely. And, and I think that, you know what, we should in future sessions, I'd love to do that with the Career Foundation because they do a lot of workshops on that as well. And all of these workshops at the end of the day point to your mindset. Yep. How you think is going to be reflective yep. or should be reflective of how you act. And, and Eve, you've done a lot of work in getting companies to sort of read what they're not writing or think about what they're not saying and think about you know, their blind spots. That's something Career Foundation has really excelled in. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you're peering into the mindset of employers and employees and getting them to understand some new realities when it comes to technology jobs, especially in cyber? Yeah. So for example, I'll start off with um, a project that we're currently doing um, with Accenture. Um, they're helping us to create sort of a plugin, if you will, um, that will help employers identify some things that they put on the job posting that screens people out for no good reason. Yep. And that, that is, that's been a huge barrier for differently able people, for women, uh, for youth, for newcomers to Canada, just the language itself makes you feel that I'm not going to be welcome there. They're looking for a different kind of person. And so employers are really, from a business standpoint, losing a lot of talent because they're not being um, thoughtful about this process. And so we're working with Accenture to identify those pain points that through interviews with the newcomers, um, what are some of those pain points for them when they're looking at applications? And the next part of that will be to educate employers around that and demonstrating the tool and how we can move this really quickly by changing the language to more inclusive than screening people out. 
Um, so that's that's just one example of how we're doing this. Ali, if you'll allow me, I'd really Absolutely. like to go back to your point, Funke, about um, what's happening uh, around um, stereotypes uh, and people speaking um, poorly about people from different countries. I mean, I myself, I, I work on my cell phone a lot. I keep getting calls from everywhere from New Brunswick to Vancouver. <laughs> And so, you know, trying to scam me into something or the other. And so I don't think that we recognize that, like we hold on to stereotypes that sometimes serve our own narrative. And we need to check that bias when we're saying those things and why we've said it, because those things happen in different countries across, I mean, in Canada too, right? And so I think we need to always challenge those things. Um, I mean, there's hackers, and they're ethical hackers yeah. everywhere, 100%. and regardless of what country you come from. And so I think we just need to make sure that we keep advancing that narrative because there's equality in the negative dark side of things and the positive one. So I just I just want to hone in on that. Okay. Now, there are two questions that I still have to work with, and I know we've got about 12 to 13 minutes. I'm going to forewarn you. Forewarned is forearmed. I'll take the slightly easier question first. And then I'm going to take the real challenging one next. But I will tell you that if you're not comfortable answering it, you can always say, hey, Ali, that's an offline conversation. And we'll deal with that there. I'm going to read this question out verbatim for you. And a shout out uh, to the audience member who posted this there. The question is, how can we navigate office-related politics, you know, especially when it comes to differently abled individuals and how it can be, you know, you're noticing something's going on. You're noticing that there's, it's difficult to break certain stereotypes that are there. And you've got, let's say, if you're, if you're differently abled, there's something that's not obvious that, you know, you, for example, you mentioned autism, not very obvious. How do we ensure that, especially in cyber communities, where we value speed, where we value immediacy, where we value instantaneity, how can we ensure that we can have these conversations and create safe spaces where we can shift thinking as well? Funke, let's start off with you about how can we get the cyberspace to just pause and reflect on some of these issues? That's a good question. Uh, I will say that, first of all, it was, I mean, you're, okay, so rephrase or paraphrase the question. The person is asking if, um, if they notice um, something around the politics within the organization around for especially quote unquote people with disabilities, but they don't know how to address it. That is correct. Right? Yep. Yeah, that's a tricky one, I would say. And um, I'm curious to see what um, the other panelists think. But from, pers from my personal experience, I will speak from the experience that I know. I've worked in an organization where cybersecurity already is fast paced. It's a quick environment. Every day is different, things are evolving. But one thing that my organization has always done is to ensure that the people culture is not lacking. Because at the end of the day, if people don't feel, especially the fact that we're in a pandemic, if people don't feel that they are valued, they, they can not bring their best self to work. And that's just it. And if you don't bring your best self to work, you're already, you're already disgruntled before you start your day. You can not come in with all the energy that they needed to bring. You won't have the time to have to think, to think about bright ideas to solve complex situations. So the people culture is, part, is really important in my organization, I can speak for sure. And because of that, they've created environments even from the management level to each teams to ensure that you're comfortable to speak about whatever it is that is bothering you if you're feeling a particular type of way or if you feel any form of sentiment. So it's an open environment where you can discuss in a, you know, in a professional manner if you're sensing that there's something off without something, it's how things are being handled. So it, to summarize, I would say it's a safe environment to have the conversation if we were to be my organization. If it's a different organization, which is what I'm guessing the person is, um, is asking the question, I would say you have to understand what the culture is around there. Does it look like a toxic environment? I mean, cybersecurity is already interesting enough. Do you want to do that in a toxic environment? I don't know. <laughs> so for me, I would say, yeah, I would say that, um, I would say the, you have to look at what the environment is like. What are some of the things that, what, what, what stands out to you about that organization? Read up on them. What's their people culture? 
how do they deal with these types of situation? People culture is really important. How are they dealing? What, what's their culture around, the, um, around whatever aspect it is? Let's say, for example, it's promotion. So I feel like I'm on this level for too long, but my peers that happen to be more articulate, then they, they seem to grab things faster. They are being promoted every other year and I'm on the same level. You know, sensible, um, sorry, sensitive situations around that, you should, you should be able to have a forum where you can discuss about that. If it's a coach, a mentor within your organization, say, okay, I feel that compared to my peers, you don't have to say compared to Ali, Ali started last year. And then, you know, mm -hmm. compared to my peers, I feel that there is no career growth for me. Is there any particular reason why? It could, it could be other things except for what you might already have in your mind. And then that way you can flush it out and clear it once and for all. I mean, that's Maya Angelou said, nothing, and there's a way she's, Maya Angelou says this, well, there's nothing that burns more than untold story. So yeah. if you keep it in your mind and you don't ever discuss or talk about it, it will just, you know, you, you keep foiling that bias or whatever it is, and it won't really help you. You can't bring your full self to work if you have the type of mindset, to be honest. So you might want to have to talk about it and be sure that you clear the air. And yeah, that's what I would say. Uh, I would agree with you 100%. And while, you know, there's a lot of focus on strategy, how do I strategically navigate a situation? You've got to look at results. And Kaylee, I'll, I'll work that question a little bit differently is, you know, when you start mm -hmm. thinking about teams and cybersecurity and how you can incorporate more diverse teams and create safe spaces mm -hmm. for conversations, how do you how do you bring up training around that? How do you train different individuals to start realizing how to ah. be trained? Yeah. Yeah, very good question. Um, I like the reframe as well. So I think, um, you know, something that's really important to remember when you're feeling, um, in, I understand why someone would be hesitant to bring it up in the workplace. If you have different learning needs, if you need accommodations, you know, I think everyone's seen both. There's employers who are extremely accommodating and um, want to give you what you need. And then there are some employers who are a little bit more hesitant as well. It, it all depends. So I totally get why you'd be hesitant to bring it up. But what I think something that's, that's crucial to remember um, is that once somebody has hired you, that employer has already made an investment in you, right? So from that point on, they're going to want to do everything in their power, you would think, to, to see you succeed in your role and, and to empower you. They have seen something in you um, that, and that means, you know, you're an asset to their business and they want you there. Um, so I don't think you should ever be afraid to, to bring something like that up in the workplace. Like, it can be very awkward, you know, even speaking from my own experience, there was nothing stranger than having to like walk into my boss's office on the first day of work and say, you know, I have, I have epilepsy and if I have a seizure, this is what you need to do, but it won't affect my work. And that was my first. And then their response was, well, we're more worried about your health than your work. So what can we do to make this easier for you and better for you and make sure you succeed? And for me, that looked like switching offices so that I didn't work in an office, which had a wall with like 45 screens. Um, and the lots of screens are bad if you're photosensitive like me. So, so things like that. And then once I was in a work environment that was safer for me, I was way more productive and successful. Um, and I honestly probably could have brought it up even sooner. So, and then in terms of like addressing what you said about, about training needs, um, First of all, even the, like average people, you know, there's four of us here on this call. We probably all have very different learning styles to begin with. Um, if you're an auditory learner, a visual learner, if you learn by doing, like um, everyone has, has different learning needs right off the bat. Um, and if you need, uh, you know, extra in one direction or the other, I don't think that would ever come as, as a shock to an employer. Um, most employers will be invested in your professional development because they too want you to be top talent. They too want you to be cutting edge. Um, so I think, you know, as long as you can remember that you are a valued employee and that you are who you are and you should love who you are and your employer will too, like, if you can accept all of these things, I think that 
these are things that we can have open dialogue about in any workplace in 2021 I hope I hope <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I, I don't know if that answers the question there was another kind of like Neither. diplomatic roundabout answer but okay it certainly does <laughs> just to our audience i know we have a couple of more minutes left but just to our audience next week at canadian women in Cybersecurity, the CISO from the city of toronto with uh, five of his colleagues from the office of the CISO, all women are going to be doing a session called speed with direction and talking about you've got to move fast the cyberspace is fast but there needs to be direction and if you look at you know, when you're talking about these complexities around, you know, differently abled individuals, et cetera, I advise you to watch that session because take a look at some of the roles that have emerged in that office of the C. So new titles, new roles, new responsibilities. Now I'm going to, we have only about two and a half minutes left and I really want to get to this last question. And Eve, I'm going to bring it to you and you can also comment on the previous question as well. And then we'll have quick concluding remarks on this question. And that is, what is the difference in your perspective, Eve, if you tell, if you help teams with creating cyber roles, is it about making equal opportunity or equitable opportunities? What would you say are the differences there? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think it is about equitable opportunities um, because equal means everyone's at the same level, everyone's at the same experience, yeah. um, and so that that's that's not possible that's not possible and people need to be sort of um their strengths need to be honed and so you work with them as individuals to bring out the best and and bring out what they can contribute to your to your project or your team and so i think it is about equitable access um based on the needs of of people and how they can uniquely contribute uh going back to what kaylee was talking about um you know we we just people, not necessarily uh, women or youth or whomever, people generally look at ourselves from a deficit yeah. perspective. Yeah. And we look at, oh my gosh, but if they know that I have this need, uh, they're not going to give me the job. Well, what COVID did was show that we all had needs and we all needed accommodation. <laughs> and if employers wanted us to contribute uh, continuously and uninterrupted, they needed to support those uh, needs. And so that's not unlike anyone else, you know, a, a single mom or a differently abled person, you need accommodations to be able to contribute the best that you have. And I think instead of trying to strategize your way and navigate your way around that, have dialogue with your supervisors around the things, the assets that you bring to the table and what you need to be able to enable you to, to contribute that even more. I think that would be the approach. And that's an equitable example. It's equitable based on my need wow. and what you want from me, right? Absolutely. And I think it's absolutely important to make sure that you are looking not just as areas of concern, but we're talking about areas of improvement. If we frame our languages correctly, then we can look at these opportunities to have these dialogues as opportunities for improvement. And who doesn't like a team that's focused on continuous improvement? Yeah. Panke, 30 seconds on your side, very quickly, this equity and equality paradigm, how do you sort of approach it? And how do you advise companies to put out roles out there that are equitable to different skill sets? Panke. 30 seconds is too short. <laughs> I know. Um, I would say that um, they can put out the roles uh, in a way that, I mean, I think it's, I don't know if, let me tweak your question a little bit. Is it really about what the companies are putting out or how the person that is applying is reading the rules? Just to Eve's point, if you're reading the rules and you feel like, oh, I feel like this is, you're already limiting yourself. I mean, the employer will put out what they are looking for. Just to Kaylee's point, and if you, they see that you have what they are looking for, they will hire you. I know that there's sometimes that some job request, some um, job opportunities will have you filling out some extra, um, sorry, roles around is a your person of color and this and the rest of all that. But focus on the skills and what value that you know that you can bring to them. As long as you invest in yourself before you see that job opening and you apply for the job, I don't see. I mean, I see, I see you working more on the equity as against the equal mm -hmm. part being at peers with yourself. I mean, your other colleagues. I don't know. I'm trying to rush up the 30 seconds because oh. I know we're almost on time. Totally so we got it. Case in point, we should definitely have more sessions on this. Kelly, closing remarks to you and then we'll conclude. <laughs> Similar question, Kelly, your perspective. 
30 seconds. <laughs> 30, seconds. 30 seconds. Yeah. Okay. On the clock. Let's go. Um, so yeah, I mean, making sure there's a quality in the workplace and in your hiring practices is crucial. Um, but I think uh, that it's more about the selection process than the recruitment process, right? Because I think that's where the different personality types and the different needs will arise is um, in, in the selection and onboarding process more so than recruitment. You know, like most companies have pretty stringent recruitment guidelines, like the you have 25 different buzzwords to work with and that's what your job ad looks like. And it's also important to remember Nobody ever meets 100% of the criteria on a job ad. Yeah. Yeah, like it's like an average of 60%. So you should never be dissuaded from applying for something because mm -hmm. you don't meet all the criteria. Um, and if you have like expectations of your employer, which you should, everyone should have expectations of their employer. It's a relationship, right? It's not just them. Like, um, they have needs of you and you have needs too. And you should absolutely, you know, express those. Um, when you're being, I would say when you're being onboarded, if you're comfortable with it during interviews and stuff, it's fine too. Um, but I would always go for after the hire. So, yeah. Absolutely. And ladies, I know we could have more discussions and more conversations on this, but there is another session that's being lined up. I'm going to ask the three of you just to stay on while I conclude so that we can have a 30 second debrief offline. But ladies, thank you so much for your time today. To our audience, if you want to engage with them, they are on cyberexchange.ca. I also advise you, Carrie, I believe, from the team at Career Foundation has posted two roles that they're currently hiring for. It's on the feed. Please take a look at them. Please consider applying or reach out to them to talk to them about that role. If there's one thing that I learned, especially from that last question, it's and a mentor of mine once said this to me, and that was, listen, don't just know how to apply for a job. Know the job that you apply for. Yep. It's a very big difference. You need to do your research. I want to thank uh, Kelly. I want to thank Funke. I want to thank Eve for taking the time today for having this, having this open, candid conversation around diversity of thought and multiple areas of diversity in the cybersecurity space. Thank you again for joining us so much. Thank you all for listening. Next up is a session with Contact North on Indigenous opportunities in cybersecurity and engaging Indigenous communities in cybersecurity. And I want you all to please take that time to join that session because it's really important to remember this as a mentor of mine once said, it's different colors that make a bouquet. And in that bouquet of thought, in that bouquet of leadership, we need to start hearing out to those different voices. I'll see you all at 4 p.m. on that discussion with Contact North. Thank you all for tuning in. Ladies, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having us.